But today I'm going to talk about how deformative stress of the brainstem and spinal cord underlies many of the observed neurological conditions that we see and how correcting this deformative stress can substantially improve their lives. With this caveat that stress may underlie many of the symptoms, but with EDS there's always two or three or more factors playing. And so we may correct one aspect, but there's still several other components of the disease, of other disease processes that are affecting our clinical outcome. So I'm going to discuss these things. And when someone comes to me with this panoply of symptoms, headache, double vision, memory loss, speech difficulties, dizziness, vertigo, hearing loss, tinnitus, difficulty swallowing, choking, clumsiness, tripping, sleep apnea, numbness, paresthesias, weakness, tremors, unsteady gait, urinary and GI issues. I know either they're lying, and that's none of my patients, or the problem must come from the craniocervical junction. Or thirdly, maybe they have several things going on. So, um, the, it uh, turns out that the cervicomedullary syndrome, that grouping of symptoms, occurs commonly with Chiari. And here's a Chiari with the cerebellum, the floccular nodular lobe of the cerebellum pushing down through the frame and magnum. And so the standard treatment of that is a decompression. The only problem is that 40 to 50 percent of decompressions ultimately don't improve the patient. These patients come back once the stiffness wears off, they'll come back six to 12 months later and speak to the neurosurgeon saying, you know, I really have a return of most of those symptoms. And the surgeon will say, well, I did a technically perfect surgery. Uh, there's nothing more I can do for you. But the reason is that they have, um, oh, and uh, Grab, Mapstone, and Oaks said that 50% of their pediatric group had ventral brainstem flattening. And Cahan said 40% of his cases of Chiari had basal invagination. And Menezes talks about angulation of the odontoid process, and Millerat reported 96 of his 365 patients having a retroflexed odontoid. And this is a fulcrum over which the lower brainstem and upper spinal cord is pulled, causing uh, symptoms from the brainstem and spinal cord. So this problem of complex Chiari and brainstem deformity uh, was discussed by uh, Doug Brockmeyer from his series uh, from Mayo, and I've reported on it in Robert Bolo. And, but Brockmeyer, in his retrospective study, said the complex Chiari was often due to brainstem herniation, medullary kinking, a retroflexed odontoid, abnormal clivoaxial angle, and basilar invagination. These were all conditions that commonly occur with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. And it's because of the craniocervical instability that's the direct result of the ligamentous laxity. And so uh, in order to treat this deformative stress from the anatomical deformity, uh, he, or at the Mayo Clinic, they had performed uh, transoral odontodectomies on 20% of those complex patients and on 56% of them, they had performed uh, posterior craniocervical fusions. So the idea of performing craniocervical fusions on patients with craniocervical laxity is very common. We've been doing it for 40 years. And uh, Goal recently published a study on 108 patients with atlantoaxial instability. And many of them have this retroflex panis, uh, odontoid and the panis, which is a result of chronic instability. So EDS is characterized by loose ligaments, and loose ligaments cause a floppy head syndrome. The head slides forward and backward over the spine, and this causes stretching and deformation of the lower brainstem, the upper spinal cord, the lower cranial nerves, the vertebral artery, and even the soft tissues, the ligaments and muscles. Even during normal motion, uh, large axial strains are produced. Now this is a cadaveric preparation by Professor Brieg. Here's a brain stem uh, with the bone removed. And you can see with the brain stem in a neutral position, 
the glossopharyngeal nerve is relaxed, and then on flexion it becomes stretched. And, and axial strains are produced. Here these striped cardboard pieces are pulled apart as the brainstem uh, stretches. That's the normal condition. And deformative stress is not only stretching, but it's also deformation or compression. And such as from a retroflex to dontoid or disc. And that compression not only causes local histological changes, but also increases the linear longitudinal tensile stress. So what's the pathological substrate of this stress? They are these small silver staining axon bulbs, retraction bulbs. The same things we see uh, with uh, diffuse head injury following a motor vehicle accident. We see them in the brainstem of shaken baby syndrome. And uh, we were the first to describe them in the spinal cord and lower brainstem uh, as a result of what we deemed to be stretch myelopathy, stretch encephalopathy. Now, I was told when I began the study 20 years ago at, under Professor Alan Crockard at the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery in London that in these 10 patients who had died of compression on the brainstem, that I would find vascular changes. And these, these patients died because they didn't get enough blood flow to the brainstem. We found no vascular changes. We only found these stretch-induced changes. And uh, in the subsequent 10 years, Pablo Schock came out with his seminal work on what happens to stretch neurons, the microfilaments, or the, the neurofilaments and microtubules, which are responsible for conduction of metabolites up and down nerves, begin to clump. Uh, and several days later, they form these big axon bulbs. And uncorrected, uh, those nerves will then separate in a process called axontomesis. And if you stretch a nerve experimentally, you see these clumping, this clumping occurring very quickly, within two hours. And Setman showed if you stretch a mouse optic nerve just 20% of its length, you'll see the formation of these axon bulbs. And at 10 days, you see programmed cell death and uh, death of many of these uh, neurons. Wolf showed that if you stretch a neuron, there is distortion of the sodium channels, a big influx of sodium into the nerve. And this causes depolarization of the voltage-gated calcium channels and a reversal of the sodium-calcium gradient and a big influx of calcium into the neuron, which is shown here in yellow. Now, that process uh, was inhibited by treating these nerves with tetrodotoxin, which blocks the sodium channels, shown down uh, below. And calcium in the cell, in the neuron, can cause many deleterious changes. Arendine showed that if you stretch a nerve, you actually influence the genes in the nerve, the DNA, to begin production of certain uh, bio chemical products, in this case, N-methyldeaspartate that we heard of earlier. And the N-methyldeaspartate makes nerves more sensitive, but also makes them more vulnerable to other forms of injury. And stretching can cause programmed cell death or apoptosis. So then mechanical forces modulate gene expression and biochemical composition directly affecting neurons and making them more sensitive and more vulnerable to injury. And we see electrophysiologically just stretching a nerve, applying a slow stretch, uh, we'll see uh, a progressively increasing stretch, we'll see a decrement in the compound action potential. That's the nerve response to a stimulus. And if we apply that stretch rapidly, we see a much greater response as in a whiplash injury. And we published in 1994 the effects of deformation on the brainstem in causing sleep apnea and how the sleep apnea resolved after a transoral odontodectomy and posterior effusion. And all of these concepts were put together uh, in 2005. Actually, I went through 10 revisions on this. Uh, but 
we published an extended article on the concept of stretch-associated uh, myelopathy. And I think it's um, entering into, general, uh, into a general understanding. So now I'm going to talk about uh, published indices of deformative stress, how we can measure instability uh, radiographically. So the, the clavoaxial angle uh, is, is fairly subtle, uh, but incredibly important. And uh, Scoville said that if the brainstem, or, or that angulation of the brainstem causes uh, neurological instability. And 30 years ago, Gilder and Smoker said that an angulation of the clivus vertebral angle of less than 150 degrees was associated with bulbar symptoms, lower brainstem symptoms. And Menezes said that a retroflexed odontoid serves as a fulcrum over which the spinal cord is stretched and causes symptoms. So that clavoaxial angle looked very normal to me, and any radiologist would say that was normal. But if you measure that angle, it's abnormal. It's 130 degrees. Here's a normal clavoaxial angle. It's 165 degrees in the neutral. And here it is in flexion at 155 degrees and on extension 175 degrees, reflecting 20 degrees of flexion extension, range of motion between, uh, between flexion and extension. That's normal. Now, the clavoaxial angle, therefore, is a surrogate measurement of basal invagination and of cervicomedullary deformity. Kim Rekate and Klopfenstein, uh, Klopfenstein and Sontag published an article in 2004 wherein they found that all of their patients who underwent a Chiari decompression who had a clavoaxial angle of less than 135 degrees failed when they brought them back and they performed a reduction fusion stabilization, nine out of 10 of those patients had a complete resolution of their uh, Chiari symptoms. Kubota showed also that Chiari decompression failed to improve syringomyelia if the clavoaxial angle was less than 135 degrees. Now, it doesn't take much to see that if you bend the brainstem over a kyphotic clavoaxial angle, you cause stretching of the brainstem. So here's a fairly normal clavoaxial angle, here's a very kyphotic clavoaxial angle, and there's stretching of the brainstem and upper spinal cord. And the importance of this has been registered by many authors. This is not a new concept, it's well published. Benchful brainstem compression has also been measured by the method of Grab, Mapstone, and Oaks published in 1999 in their series of pediatric patients. And they said if you draw a line from the basion, that's right here, to the base of C2, and then draw a perpendicular to that, that perpendicular measurement should be less than nine millimeters. More than nine millimeters represents ventral brainstem compression. And in those children with more than nine millimeters, they performed a transoral odontodectomy going through the mouth to remove that ventral compression. And then they performed a posterior fusion. Now other uh, indices of instability include the palatovertebral angle. It's the angle between the hard palate and the top of C1 should be less than 13 degrees. And Holy and Brewer looked at 600 normal cervical spine x-rays. And they said that the distance from the basion to the dens should be fairly constant, usually around five to six millimeters, but that more than 10 millimeters would be abnormal. So this distance from the basion to the top of the dens should be less than 10 millimeters. Now Lee's x-lines, simply the line from the basion to the middle of the lamina, that line should not be transgressed by the odontoid, or that would reflect basal invagination. The Harris measurement uh, was based on his analysis of 400 normal subjects, and he said that the distance from the basion to the odontoid should be less than, uh, less than 12 millimeters, 
And importantly, the distance from the basion to the posterior axial line should be less than 12 millimeters. A distance of greater than 12 implied craniovertebral instability. So this line is excellent uh, for measuring the presence of instability between flexion and extension. Now, there should be no translation, there should be no slippage between the skull and the spine on flexion extension. The skull should be simply tilting forward and tilting back over a central pivot point. And Fielding said that flexion extension is the only motion at the normal occipito-atlantal joint. Burns said there is no horizontal translation in the occipito-atlantal joint. And Wiesel and Rothman said the normal range of horizontal translation and flexion extension is no more than one millimeter. Movement of greater than one millimeter is clinically significant and treatment by posterior craniocervical fusion is proved successful. And Punjabi and White said that more than one millimeter of translation and flexion extension is an important and useful criterion and symptoms of weakness of the limbs and occipital pain are additional indications of instability. So here's a normal patient or a normal uh, bending. Actually that clavoaxial angle is abnormal but, but there's no sliding. You see that basion lies right over the middle of the odontoid in both flexion and extension. And, and here's an abnormal case where in flexion the basion has moved anteriorly and in extension it's moved posteriorly. And there's five millimeters of movement and the same in this case. Anyway, three years ago we published a series of patients who had deformative stress associated with an abnormal clavoaxial angle. This group of patients were children. And the primary outcome measurements, careful neurologic exams, sensory motor uh, scales, the Asia scale, pain with a visual analog scale, quality of life index, Karnofsky index. We made up this brainstem disability index, a list of all the cervicomedullary symptoms, and then MRI measurements. This is the brainstem disability index. This is the symptoms of, this, of the cervicomedullary syndrome. And our indications for surgery uh, were the same as Dickman and Douglas Sontag of 1990, only we more specifically required headache and neck pain and brainstem and spinal cord symptoms and uh, reproducible neurological deficits and radiological demonstration of ventral brainstem compression and, and uh, basilar invagination. And the surgery, uh, the way I do it is I place the patient in a neck brace, position them prone in Mayfield pins, then I take the neck brace off, uh, a small shaving over the back of the head, and a prep. Uh, here's a, Chiari malforma a small Chiari malformation with some compression there. Uh, this is a suboccipital decompression. I usually remove about 15 uh, millimeters of uh, bone and do a very wide frame and magnum decompression. This is actually a cadaver here, not a real patient. Uh, we drill the, carefully drill holes for the screws, uh, avoiding the vertebral artery, perform a reduction. And this is very important. Uh, I trained in London to do a, a lot of transoral odontodectomies. And now I've found that I haven't done one in the last eight years because I'm able, after opening the back of the head and removing the muscles, to reposition the skull on the spine and normalize the relationship of the cranium to the spine so that a transoral odontodectomy uh, is only uh, rarely uh, required. Uh, as I said, I haven't done one in years. So uh, this is the method by Kim, Rekate, Klopfenstein, and Sontag of traction and then extension and then I add a little translation to get the position perfectly normalized. And we look at the clavoaxial angle, the basion odontoid me measurement, the occipital cervical angle, the distance from, from, the, uh, odont uh, from the second cervical vertebrae to the mandible, the attitude of the gaze 
and this is an iterative process. It might take two or three uh, manipulations of the head to get it just right. And then we do uh, attach the uh, posterior rods and do the fusion. And they're the rods and, and then uh, rib bones uh, um, for the fusion. And there's a patient at month. And the range of motion of the neck is actually uh, surprisingly reasonably preser preserved because we're only fusing down to C2 and the patients are usually hypermobile at the other levels. In this first series we published, um, surprisingly many of them had autism or high functioning autism. Uh, outcomes were good. One patient had continued headaches. The, I'll show you a couple of cases. This child uh, had repeated cardiorespiratory arrests, postural orthostatic tachycardia, decreased memory, vision auditory changes, dysphagia, dizziness, gait change, weakness, sensory loss, uh, fairly significant uh, neurologic deficits. They went to many neurosurgeons and for some reason, uh, I don't know why they didn't see this immediately and, and recognize it. But the family were told to take the child home and prepare him to die. Uh, so we performed a routine surgery. Here's the fusion. And a year later, the child was playing sports, achieving A-levels. Uh, some years later, got a pilot's license, now studying aerospace engineering at a top university on a scholarship. This 16-year-old girl, uh, Severe headaches, 50% truancy because of headaches. And very clumsy, poor balance. She said, I know what to do, I just can't tell my body what to do. Jerking motions of her legs in class, her teachers did not like her. They thought she was always disruptive. Weakness, hyperextensible joints, spastic reflexes, sleep apnea, MRI read as normal. And she had an abnormal cliveaxial angle. We fixed that. And there's the post-operative. Her pain went to zero. Uh, all her brainstem disability symptoms resolved. Her Karnofsky scale went to 100. Quality of life better than normal. Cycling 11 miles a day. The looseness in her joints just went away completely. And she went from being very floppy to very strong. Um, captain of the debating team, straight A's after college. So if we look at the whole series, uh, we saw improvements in the Asia, that's sensory motor findings, Konofsky, and quality of life. And despite the small number of patients, we saw statistical significance of improvement in every case. Now, I want to look at some more recent data, and this is strictly patients with diagnosed by Claire and Brad Tinkle with uh, with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. And there were patients that we collected from July of 2011 to February 2012. So just a consecutive series of 20 patients. And um, uh, the, the, this is a slightly preliminary thing. We only had the data from 18 patients, and now we've got it from all 20, but we haven't analyzed it yet. But uh, I think we'll have 100% uh, data collection on these patients. And so it, uh, it, it's still in the process right now. So we asked them, and looking back, all of these patients had a craniocervical reduction fusion stabilization for being floppy-headed with a cervical medullary syndrome. Most of them were pretty desperate. Looking back, I would still choose to have the craniovertebral fusion surgery. And two-thirds uh, strongly agreed 22% agreed, 11% somewhat agreed. Uh, by the way, all these responses were uh, to a questionnaire and they're de-identified, so the patients know that I don't know what they said about the surgery. If I had a family member or a close friend, would I recommend the same? And the response is fairly similar, except 5% uh, somewhat disagreed. My quality of life was improved. 50% uh, uh, strongly agreed, 22% agree, and 28% somewhat agree. And I think uh, this reflects the presence of other EDS issues.
they need more treatment and other problems. Having this surgery improved my symptoms. Uh, strongly agree, one third agree, 25%, somewhat agree, one third, uh, somewhat disagree. Uh, this is two patients out of the 18 that we had collected. I'm gonna have to find out who they were and they will pay, no. <laughs> Just out of curiosity, if there is some reduction of, of motility of the head after the fusion, then they could interpret that as their limitations were increased because they're thinking of range of motion, perhaps. And so you have to. I um, think it isn't actually important to find out what they were thinking when they answered that question. Um, they they, yeah, it, uh, that would be a good question to ask. Uh, just from my knowledge, none of the patients have really complained of loss of, cranial, of head mobility. They all drive, and, um, but, but there are just so many other issues. But, but I will look into that. That would be a good thing to nail down. All right, so the following uh, review of symptoms I'm gonna run through about 15 symptoms now and, and how they responded to the surgery. And clearly, in some cases, um, the surgery targeted those symptoms pretty well, and in others, it did not. And, and we need to be looking for other EDS-like problems. So uh, this is 18 uh, patients that we looked at. And average headache, 89% reported a decrease in average headaches. And here's the frequency of headache uh, before surgery in red and after. Now notice they still have headaches. The headaches have not gone away completely. They're just much more livable. Um, oh, sorry, that, that last one was uh, uh, headache pain. And the headache frequency has uh, markedly diminished. Uh, neck pain, 83% had neck pain prior to surgery. Two thirds reported less neck pain after surgery. One quarter reported it was the same. And so we see the frequency of neck pain decreasing. Sorry. All of the patients reported dizziness before surgery. Two thirds reported feeling less dizzy after surgery. And the frequency of that dizziness, oh, sorry. The frequency of that dizziness has, uh, has decreased. But I, I just wanna emphasize that many of these symptoms are still there, they're just markedly decreased. Vertigo, 56% reported vertigo prior to surgery, 90% less vertigo after surgery. Memory, 83% of patients reported memory issues prior to surgery, and two thirds of those less memory problems after. So here's the frequency of memory issues, much less, less common, less often. Some patients feel absolutely wonderful one day, and then a week later they may have a day or two of brain fog. Hearing problems, 60% had hearing before surgery, 54% uh, reported less afterwards and less frequency of hearing problems. 61% reported speech problems before surgery. Of those, 63% reported less speech problems after surgery. And the frequency of speech problems was uh, less, less often. Choking and swallowing, two thirds had choking and swallowing issues, of which 58% reported less uh, problems after surgery. Sleep apnea, uh, surprisingly in this group, sleep apnea was not a, a big problem. I didn't get sleep studies on, all of the, on most of these patients, I should have. So a lot of them probably weren't sure whether or not they had sleep apnea, so let's skip over that one. Fainting, uh, a third reported fainting prior to surgery and after surgery, 50% uh, less fainting. I think that's underreporting when we get the rest of the data. I think we'll find that the amount of syncopal episodes is much more, the decrease is much more than 50%. 83% reported visual problems prior to surgery, 
of those, 53% reported less visual problems after surgery. Numbness in the arms, hands, shoulders, 77% had issues prior to surgery, of whom 71% reported less problems after surgery. And you see the frequency of numbness in the arms and hands is significantly decreased. Numbness in the back, 40%, of whom 57% reported less numbness in the back after surgery. And the frequency of back pain was less. Walking, 83% had problems with walking, 60% improved. Balance, 83% had balance issues, 73% reported improvement and less frequency of balance issues. Weakness of the arms and hands, 89% prior to surgery, of whom two-thirds reported improvement. Now, in these symptoms, only one-third of patients reported improvements. So the surgery does not address, for the most part, joint pain, muscle pain, fatigue, sleep apnea, night awakenings, dysautonomic phenomena such as hands and feet turning cold, numbness and weakness in the legs and feet, that would be more likely tethered cord syndrome, tremors, uh, uh, urinary issues, irritable bowel syndrome, and GERDs. Having said that, I have a many notable cases where a, a, a professor of economics had irritable bowel syndrome for 20 years, and then after surgery, he woke up and he didn't have it anymore. Uh, and uh, we're just hearing from a family member today who had very floppy joints, uh, and after surgery, her, her joint pains just resolved immediately. So, uh, about one third of these symptoms got better, but many of these symptoms also got worse. So it's clearly got a, the, the many issues besides the craniovertebral junction. Okay, let's, uh, now all of the patients had some rib pain. It was fairly mild, about 2.7, but I've modified the rib harvesting procedure and eventually I hope to do away with uh, rib harvesting uh, when I get satis uh, acceptable alternatives. Limitations of the study were that it was retrospective, so there's some poor recall on the part of the patients. Uh, all of the subjects had multiple comorbidities, and let's remember that EDS patients rank a three to four on a zero to five scale of preoperative morbidity, potential morbidity. Uh, to give you an idea, if you're doing a craniotomy, on this morbidity scale, that ranks as a 1.5, and an EDS patient ranks as a three to four. And the, um, so conclusions, kyphotic clavoaxial angle in conjunction with carry malformation or craniocervical instability may result in deformative stress on the brainstem and upper spinal cord, resulting in a broad array of neurological symptoms. And these results may be difficult to discern uh, where there's other instability lower in the spine and other EDS issues. Uh, nevertheless, normalizing that clavoaxial angle and stabilizing the joint did improve in the majority of cases headaches, neck pain, dizziness, fainting, vertigo, visual and hearing memory problems, speech, swallowing issues, numbness in the hands, arms, shoulders, numbness in the back, walking and balance weakness in the arms and hands. Now, I want to um, look at uh, atlantoaxial subluxation. Uh, everyone who comes in with that list of symptoms doesn't have craniocervical instability. They may have instability limited to the first two vertebrae. And if you look at this, this is the C1 uh, ring, and here's the odontoid. And this patient is turning to the uh, left side, and you see that the uh, C2, it's a bit hard for you to, I suppose, recognize, but it's almost dislocated from C1. So this is a very uh, unstable condition. It's a rotary C12 instability. And these patients complain of neck pain and headache, worse when driving, especially on bumpy roads, women drivers, 
nausea, postural orthostatic tachycardia, dysautonomia, pain with neck turning, pain over the C12 spinous processes, decreased pinprick sensation on exam. Uh, they can feel the pinprick, but you can stick them pretty hard and it, it, it's not a painful stimulus, even on the hands. Hyperreflexia, surprisingly no weakness, they have dystidocokinesia. They're improved with the neck brace and the CT confirmation, obviously, that I've just showed you. And um, the technique that I've uh, settled on places screws on one side of the vertebrae through C1 and C2. And then I place a bone graft between C1 and C2 and place these small uh, many plates to prevent rotational torque. Um, I thought I had another picture of that. And uh, uh, this has been very successful. Uh, we can do it through a small incision. Patients are up on their feet on the same day. And I've had some patients going home on the next day. No complications to date. Uh, keep them in the neck brace for three or four weeks. No failures of fusion or hardware. Now, this is a, another subtle problem, and um, I suppose this pertains to that paper that we published uh, in 2005, and Ed Benzel showed me some very interesting cases of his that looked quite normal on their neutral MRI and when he did a flexion MRI. Uh, there's stretching of the spinal cord and a complete resolution of symptoms. So we know that all patients with EDS have a or a proclivity to discopathy in all the cervical levels. And if, if they develop an instability at one level, this can cause a stretch myelopathy with numbness and tingling of the hands and legs, and un otherwise unexplained weakness of the arms and legs, gait problems, urinary urgency and other issues, nausea and headache. That's the typical presentation. So here's a patient. Uh, normal looking MRI, that's a perfectly normal MRI. But when you get a dynamic sitting upright MRI in flexion and extension, you see on flexion that there's an angulation between C4 and C5 of more than, you know, that looks like about 15 degrees. And on extension, you'll see the C4 vertebrae slipping posteriorly a, a few millimeters and so, going back to this uh, picture from Brieg, here's the normal spinal cord. When you bend your neck forward, you cause a stretching of the spinal cord. But if you have a pathological angulation, that causes a lot more stretch. And uh, um, let me just, uh, Punjabi uh, said that if you have an angulation between vertebrae that's more than 11.5 degrees, that's pathological. That's going to cause neurological problems. So uh, we perform a reduction and a fusion stabilization, just bone from the bone bank and a plate. And this, this patient had been suffering extreme pain, 9 out of 10, for a couple of weeks, couldn't walk, no balance, uh, nausea, headaches, um, the full panoply of, of, uh, of symptoms that I reported. And once we recognized that problem and fixed it, uh, within three days she was up and, and as normal as could be. So let me go down now to another form of stretching and deformation of the central nervous system, which is tethered cord syndrome. All of these issues deal with stretching the ner nervous system. And the phylum terminal is simply a thread that goes from the conus, the end of the spinal cord, to the base of the spine. And it's normally half a millimeter in thickness and very floppy. But for some reason, in Ehlers-Danlos, more often it is thickened and possibly more collagenous and applies a stretching on the end of the spinal cord. Now, when I was in training in the 80s, my chairman, who was one of the greats, uh, Fano Pro, doubted that tethered cord syndrome existed. And by the 90s, everyone recognized that tethered cord syndrome uh, could be diagnosed on an MRI and was 
and it, it became a, a routine surgery. Uh, and then in the 90s, we began to realize that many patients had tethered cord syndrome, but which was radiologically occult. And this particularly appears to be the case in the EDS population. It's a clinical diagnosis. In, in the young, the most common finding is weakness of the legs that's otherwise unexplained. You have to rule out muscular dystrophy. It's associated with low back pain, sensory loss, especially in the sacral dermatomes, a neurogenic bladder, and the urodynamic should show a large post-void residual, a sphincter detrusor dysinergia. And of course, we want to rule out things like diabetes, multiple sclerosis, Lyme's disease. There should be a history of UTI, of aneurysis or bedwetting, a history of being pigeon-toed and toe-walking, uh, sleeping with the knees bent. And keep in mind that uh, tethered cord syndrome can cause headaches and paresthesias of the hands. So I said that in EDS, tethered cord is usually radiologically occult, but there are other findings that we often see like this fatty phylum, and sometimes we see absence of the bone over the sacrum, what would be a spina bifida occulta. There may be a syringomyelia in the lower cord and scoliosis. And with a patient in the prone position, we may see the spinal cord lifted more posteriorly instead of sagging anteriorly. So there's some soft radi radiological findings. And here's the phylum intraoperatively. Uh, you can see here, this is about three millimeters in thickness. Here, clumps of other nerves. This is the dura that covers all of the quarter quina, the nerves of the lower lumbar spine. So once we take out a piece of this phylum, usually the ends retract briskly. So um, uh, a little ways back, we uh, conducted a random sampling of 13 patients by a third party, and very quickly uh, we saw improvement in 11 out of the 13 patients uh, neurologically, functional improvement in 10, quality of life, 8, pain change in 11. Um, all but one patient said they'd do the surgery again, and they would recommend it to a family friend or member, family friend, sorry, a friend or a family member. The complications of the surgery are usually uh, fluid under the skin. I had to go back and reoperate on them. And since then, I've changed my technique and we've not had any more. So I, th I think that this is a low morbidity procedure uh, with a very high value of uh, improvement. Uh, so tethered cord syndrome is a result of tension of the phylum terminal and stretching of the spinal cord. In EDS patients, it's a clinical diagnosis, more often radiologically occult. And in well-selected patients, sectioning the phylum improves pain, function, and neurological deficit in more than 85% of patients. I think I'm getting improvement in more like 95% now. And finally, uh, I think we've gone over this list. Uh, uh, these are symptoms where we may expect to see Improvement in the majority of patients who undergo reduction fusion stabilization for craniovertebral instability. I'd like to acknowledge the uh, significant input from colleagues Claire and Brad Tinkle, Ed Benzel, Mark Alexander, and Miles Kobe, two neuroradiologists I work with, Stephen Mott, Robert Gerwin, neurologists, Josh, Joshua Murdoch, urologist, Alan Persinke, internal medicine. Joel Berry is an uh, engineer who's helped with the other issues. Alex Ficarra, Will Wilson, physical therapist. All of my patients have taught me immeasurably. And the Chiari Sringomyelia Foundation is very interested in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in this interplay of EDS and Chiari malformation and, um, and have sponsored many um, learning programs. Thank you for your attention.